Julie of the Wolves. Part one, Amarak the Wolf. Mayak pushed back the hood of her sealskin parka and looked at the Arctic sun. It was a yellow disc in a lime green sky, the colors of six o'clock in the evening and the time when the wolves awoke. Quietly, she put down her cooking pot and crept to the top of a dome-shaped frost heave, one of the many earth buckles that rise and fall in the crackling cold of the Arctic winter. Lying on her stomach, she looked across a vast lawn of grass and moss that focused her attention on the wolves she had come upon two sleeps ago. They were wagging their tails as they awoke and saw each other. Her hands trembled and her heartbeat quickened, for she was frightened, not so much of the wolves, who were shy and many harpoon shots away, but because of her desperate predicament, Mayak was lost. She had been lost without food for many sleeps on the north slope of Alaska. The barren slope stretches for 200 miles across the Brooks Range to the Arctic Ocean, and for more than 800 miles from Canada to the Chukchik Sea. No roads cross it, ponds and lakes freckle its immensity, Woods scream across it, and the view in every direction is exactly the same. Somewhere in this cosmos was Mayak, and the very life in her body, its spark and warmth, depended upon those wolves for survival. And she was not sure they would help. Mayak stared hard at the regal black wolf, hoping to catch its eye. She must somehow tell him that she was starving and ask him for food. This could be done, she knew, for her father, an Eskimo hunter, had done so. One year, he had camped near a wolf den while on a hunt. While a month had passed and her father had seen no game, he told the leader of the wolves that he was hungry and needed food. The next night, the wolf called him from far away, and her father went to him and found a freshly killed caribou. Unfortunately, Mayak's father never explained to her how he told the wolf of his needs and not long afterwards he paddled his kayak into the Bering Sea to hunt for seal, and he never returned. She had been watching the wolves for two days, trying to discern which of their sounds and movements expressed goodwill and friendship. Most animals had such signals. The little arctic ground squirrels flicked their tails sideways to notify others of their kind that they were friendly. By imitating the signal with, the, with her forefinger, Mayax had lured many a squirrel to her hand. If she could discover such a gesture, for the wolves would be able to make friends with them and share their food, like a bird or, or a fox. Propped on her elbow with her chin in her fist, she stared at the black wolf, trying to catch his eye. She had chosen him because he was much larger than the others, and because he walked like her father, Kabukin, with his head high and his chest out. The black wolf also possessed wisdom, she had observed. The pack looked at him when the wolf carried strange scents or the birds cried nervously. If he was alarmed, they were alarmed. If he was calm, they were calm. Long passed and the black wolf did not look at her. He had ignored her since she first came upon them two sleeps ago. True, she moved slowly and quietly so as to not alarm him, yet she did wish she could see, he could see the kindness in her eyes. Many animals could tell the difference between hostile hunters and friendly people by merely looking at them, but the big black wolf would not even glance her way. A bird stretched in the grass. The wolf looked at it. A flower twisted in the wind. He glanced at that. Then the breeze rippled the wolverine wolf on Mayak's parka, and it glistened in the light. He did not look at that. She waited. Patience with the ways of nature had been instilled in her by her father, and so she knew better than to move or shout, yet she must get food or die. Her hands shook slightly as she swallowed hard to keep calm. Mayak was a classic Eskimo beauty, small of bone and delicately wired with strong muscles. Her face was pearl round and her nose was flat. Her black eyes, which slanted gracefully, were moist and sparkling. Like the beautifully formed polar bears and foxes of the north, she was slightly short-limbed. The frigid environment of the Arctic had sculpted life into compact shapes. Unlike the long-limbed, long-bodied animals of the South that are colored by disappearing heat on extended surfaces, all live things in the Arctic tend towards compactness to conserve heat. 
The length of her limbs and the beauty of her face were of no use to Myax as she lay on the lichen-speckled frost heave in the midst of the black tundra. Her stomach ached and the royal black lay ignoring her. Amarak, Ela, Wolf, my friend, she finally called. Look at me, look at me. She spoke half in Eskimo and half in English, as if the instincts of her father and the science of the Gussics, the white-faced, might invoke some magical combination that would help her get the message through to the wolf. Amarat glanced at his paw and slowly turned his head her way without lifting his eyes. He looked his shoulder. A few mattered hairs sprang apart and twinkled individually. Then his eyes sped to each of the three adult wolves that made up his pack, and finally to the five pups who were sleeping in a fuzzy mass near the den entrance. The wolf's eyes softened at the sight of the little wolves, then quickly hardened into brittle yellow jewels as he scanned the flat tundra. Not a tree grew anywhere to break the monotony of the gold-green plain, for the soils of the tundra were permanently frozen. Only moss, grass, lichens, and a few hardy flowers take root in the thin upper layer that thaws briefly in summer. Nor do many species of animals live in this righteous land. But those creatures who do dwell here exist in bountiful numbers. Amarok watched a large crowd of Lapland longspurs wheel up into the sky, then all right in the grasses. Swarms of crane flies, one of the flute Few insects that can survive the cold darken the tips of the mosses. Birds wheeled, turned, and called. Thousands sprang up from the ground like leaves in the wind. The wolves' ears cupped forward and turned in on this distant message from the tundra. Myax tensed and listened too. Did he hear some brewing storm, some approaching enemy? Apparently not. His ears relaxed and he rolled to his side. She sighed, glanced at the vaulting sky, and was painfully aware of her predicament. Here she was, watching wolves. She, Myax, daughter of Capigan, adopted child of Martha, citizen of the United States, pupil at the Bureau of Indian Affairs School in Barrow, Alaska, and 13-year-old wife of the boy Daniel. She shivered at the thought of Daniel, for it was he who had driven her to this fate. She had run away from him exactly seven sleeps ago, and because of this, she had one more title of go by Gothic standards, the child de Forcy. The wolf rolled to his belly. Amrock, she whispered, I am lost and the sun will not set for a month. There is no north star to guide me. Amrock did not stir. And there were no berry bushes here to bend under the polar wind and point to the south. Nor are there any birds that I can follow. She looked up. Here the birds are buntings and long spurs. They do not fly to the sea twice a day like the puffins and sandpapers that my father followed. The wolf groomed his chest with his tongue. I never dreamed I could get lost, Amarok, she went on, talking about talking out loud to ease her fear. At home on Nunavand Island where I was born, the plants and animals pointed the way for wanderers. I thought they did so everywhere. And so, great black Amarok, I'm without a compass. It had been a frightening moment when two days ago she realized that under the tundra was an ocean of grass on which she was circling around and around. Now as that fear overcame her again, her eyes were closed. When she opened them, her heart skipped excitedly. Amarok was looking at her. Eli, she cried and scrambled to her feet. The wolf arced his neck and narrowed his eyes. He pressed his ears forward. She waved. He drew back his lips and showed his teeth. Frightened by what seemed like a snarl, she lay down again. When she was flat on her stomach, Amarok flattened his ears and wagged his tail once. Then he tossed his head and looked away. Discouraged, she wriggled backward down the frost heave and arrived at her camp feet first. The heave was between herself and the wolf pack, and so she relaxed, stood up, and took stock of her home. It was a simple affair, for she had not been able to carry much when she ran away. She took just those things she would need for the journey. A backpack, food for a week or so, needles to mend clothes, matches, her sleeping skin, and ground cloth to go under it. Two knives and a pot. She had intended to walk to Point Hope. There she would meet the North Star, the ship that brings supplies from the States to the towns on the Arctic Ocean in August when the ice pack breaks up. 
The ship could always use dishwashers or laundresses, she had heard, and so she would work her way to San Francisco, where Amy, her pen pal, lived. At the end of every letter, Amy always wrote, When are you coming to San Francisco? Seven days ago, she had been on her way, on her way to the glittering white postcard city that sat on a hill among trees, those enormous plants she had never seen. She had been on her way to see television and carpeting in Amy's school, the glass buildings, traffic lights, and stores full of fruits, on her way to the harbor that never froze and the Golden Great Gate Bridge. But primarily, she was on her way to be rid of Daniel, her terrifying husband. She kicked the sod as she thought of her marriage, then shaking her head to forget, she surveyed the, her camp. It was nice. Upon discovering the wolf, she had settled down to live near them in hope of sharing her food until the sun set and the stars came out to guide her. She had built a house of sod, like the summer homes in the old Eskimos. Each brick had been cut with her ulo, the half-moon-shaped woman's knife, so versatile that it can trim a baby's hair, slice a tough bear, or chip an iceberg. Her house was not built well, for she had never made one before, but it was cozy inside. She had windproofed it by sealing the sod bricks with mud from the pond at her door, and she had made it beautiful by spreading her caribou brown cloth on the floor. On this, she had placed her sleeping skin, a moose hide bag lined with soft white rabbit skins. Next to her bed, she had built a low table of sod on which she put her clothes when she slept. To decorate the house, she had made three flowers of bird feathers and stuck them at the top of the table. Then she had built a fireplace outdoors and placed her pot beside it. The pot was empty, for she had not found even a lemming to eat. Last winter, when she walked to school in Barrow, these mice-like rodents were so numerous they ran out from under her feet wherever she stepped. There were thousands and thousands of them, until December, when they suddenly vanished. Her teacher said that the lemmings had a chemical similar to antifreeze in their blood that kept them active all winter when the other little mammals were hibernating. They eat grass and multiply all winter, Mrs. Franklin had said in her sing-song voice. When there are too many, they grow nervous at the sight of each other. Somehow, his, this shoots too much antifreeze in their bloodstreams, and it begins to poison them. They become restless, then crazy. They run into a frenzy until they die. Of this phenomenon, Mayak's father had simply said, the hour of the lemming is over for four years. Unfortunately for Mayax, the hour of animals that prey on the lemmings was also over. The white fox, the snowy owl, the weasel, the jagger, and the siskin had virtually disappeared. They had no food to eat and bore few or no young. Those that lived pried on each other. With the passing of the lemmings, however, the grasses had grown high again and the hour of the caribou was upon the land. Healthy, fat caribou cows gave birth to many calves. The caribou population increased, and this in turn increased the number of wolves who pry on the caribou. The abundance of the big deer of the north did Mayax no good, for she had not brought a gun on her trip. It had never occurred to her that she would not reach Point Hope before her food ran out. 